Sound check one two three.
Good morning, everyone. Sunny, are we good to go? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Great. So glad uh, you all could uh, join us this morning for this uh, exciting webinar on uh, demand driven uh, material requirement planning. <clears throat> uh, I think few people are still joining us. Uh, it's just about 10. Uh, let me get started with uh, some introductions and probably in the next couple of minutes some more people should uh, join it. <clears throat> okay, I hope my screen is visible now. Uh, <coughs> All right, so good morning once again. Uh, my name is Naveen Narayanan. Uh, very excited to be with you this morning. So over the next uh, one hour or so, we will go through some of the uh, discussions on the demand-driven material requirement planning, DDMRP. Uh, I will introduce uh, the science and uh, share with you uh, a case study on the same. So the topic of this webinar is profitability improvement through inventory and supply chain optimization. Uh, we have, over the last year or so, since uh, of course the start of the pandemic, uh, there has been a heightened level of awareness about uh, some of the supply chain challenges, uh, both in terms of uh, being able to secure the material, to keep their operations running uninterrupted, and also in terms of uh, not overshooting, exceeding their inventory cover, and therefore, uh, significantly depleting uh, the return on capital. <laughs> so a uh, quick introduction about myself. My name is Naveen Narayanan. I'm MD of SSA International. Uh, I'm looking after the SSA operations in the Middle East. Uh, I come from the world of management consulting, um, spent over 17 years in uh, global management consulting and been very privileged to uh, work with some of the uh, uh, you know global multinationals uh, like Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, which is making a lot of news now. Uh, hopefully for the right reasons uh, with uh, you know others like Nortel Networks, DHL Worldwide, Godrej and so on. Uh, these are the, some of the firms that I had the privilege to uh, consult on long drawn assignments, uh, rolling out global transformation programs when they embarked on uh, Lean, Lean Six Sigma and global supply chain optimization programs uh, to bring, bring efficiencies in their global operations. Uh, I'm a certified uh, Six Sigma black belt and uh, Quality Improvement Associate from American Society for Quality. <clears throat> I'm also a demand-driven planner, certified demand-driven planner professional from the Demand Driven Institute. Uh, in fact, the subject that I'm going to be talking about today <clears throat> and, uh, and so on. So the last uh, seven odd years, I have been intensely focused on the SSA operations in the region, primarily Middle East and Africa, uh, where I was very privileged to work with a number of prestigious uh, clients uh, across the private and public sector, uh, helping them to realize their vision of business excellence and uh, driving efficiencies in their operations uh, by working with stakeholders at all levels. At the moment, I'm also pursuing my doctoral research in Lean, where I'm looking at how the uh, principles of uh, Lean and supply chain science can help to drive efficiencies in businesses, specifically uh, help them on the issue of minimizing their lead time uh, without overshooting on the uh, resource commitment to the business. So that's about myself. Uh, joining me today is uh, is Ganesh Iyer. Ganesh, I hope you're on the call. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, Ganesh uh, is vice chairman of SSA and uh, he is also managing director of uh, SSA Technologies. It's a sister firm we uh, spun off uh, about 13 years back uh, with a vision to help the industries specifically uh, battle their technology challenges, their technology enablement challenges. Uh, Ganesh comes with a very illustrious career uh, in the IT world, uh, having worked for the likes of uh, Infosys and KPMG Consulting, where uh, he was specifically chartered with uh, helping clients like uh, Microsoft and uh, others, uh, Dell Computers and so on, where he was uh, specifically chartered with the uh, mission 
uh, to I'm sorry, I'm going to mute my WhatsApp. I'm sorry about this. <laughs> so uh, he was chartered with the mission to help them to drive uh, business process efficiency and also supply chain efficiency, especially their spend management, spend analytics systems and so on. So Ganesh started SSA Technologies more with a mission to uh, bridge the gap between business and technology. And uh, he's very, very deeply involved in a lot of our assignments in the region where at the moment, for instance, he's leading the uh, the entire digital transformation of the industrial estates of uh, Oman, the uh, public establishment for industrial estates, and many other leading uh, private and public corporates in Oman, where he's helping them bring about uh, uh, their vision of digital transformation, which is one of the very, very burning issues for the industry. And he's also very passionate about uh, uh, the design and, and technology's role in new product introduction where he specializes in value engineering, value analysis, and applying the design for Six Sigma techniques in new product introduction. So Ganesh is, uh, is joining us uh, from Mumbai and uh, very excited to team up uh, with him. And he will go take us through some of the cutting edge case studies we have worked on in the demand driven space. A quick few slides about who we are. Uh, SSA was founded in 1999. So we are in the 21st year of 22nd year of, of our operations. Time flies. <laughs> Uh, NC is our founder chairman, um, uh, NC Narayanan, foundly known as uh, NC. Uh, he comes from the automotive uh, world. Uh, he had a long stint with uh, a very illustrious uh, a tier one uh, automotive leader called Lucas Tevius, uh, which is a Deming Prize winning company. And uh, NC was the head of uh, engineering and uh, technology at uh, Lucas Tevius. So he led product development as well as product cost optimization. And in his later years, uh, he was also deeply involved in the lean transformation program at the TVS Group, uh, which was one of the pioneers of deploying lean transformation in India back in the 80s. And that's when the big uh, the bug bit NC for uh, starting a management consultancy, uh, where he felt the need for a world class uh, local or a regional consulting player uh, that can help industries to solve their operational and strategic issues uh, by partnering with them. Uh, MC is an IITN and he has written several books and he's a very passionate proponent of, uh, of business improvement, business excellence, continuous improvement. And more recently, he's passionately involved in personal excellence where he writes and blogs and uh, you know uh, he runs a very popular YouTube channel where he shares daily thoughts on how to master, how to achieve personal mastery and so on. Um, quick infographic about SSA. Uh, we are over the last 20 odd years worked with uh, more than a thousand industries across the globe in 24 plus countries uh, and uh, you know about 400, 500 million and counting in terms of validated savings. Uh, we set up the local office in Oman back in 2016 uh, to serve the local industries which we felt uh, had a significant need for the work we do. But our journey in Oman started much earlier, around 2012-2013, where we were invited by a number of groups and we ended up partnering with a number of them in their mission to achieve business excellence and efficiencies. So what is it that excites us? Uh, we are quite passionate about the following areas. Of course, uh, today we may not have the time to delve into Many of the other areas today, we are going to be spending much time on the supply chain optimization and maybe a little bit on uh, how the IT enablement uh, feeds into supply chain and business efficiency. Uh, but we are also very deeply involved in strategy planning and execution. We are working with a number of uh, conglomerates, a number of divisions within those conglomerates and helping them to drive uh, a unified vision in terms of strategy planning, uh, goal deployment, and uh, identifying and facilitating the implementation of strategic initiatives. Uh, we have also lately gotten uh, quite involved in uh, RTA Industry 4.0 um, space of knowledge creation and capability creation. Uh, lean manufacturing, data and performance analytics are some of the other areas where we are very, very passionate about. So a small cross section of clients we work with, we are domain agnostic in that we work with uh, pretty much uh, the entire spread right from FMCG to oil and gas, if you will. And uh, over the years, uh, we have uh, acquired or amassed a uh, wealth of uh, experiences in working with a lot of these corporates uh, in dealing with a lot of their uh, 
specific challenges, be it in terms of dealing with uh, their competition or a competitive threat in local markets, or in terms of meeting their vision to globalize successfully by and still preserving shareholders' wealth. Uh, one example, we work very closely with Godrej Industries for, for those of us who are from India, know them as a very prominent uh, you know, multi-generation uh, uh, business uh, that has now in the, in the recent decade very successfully globalized in uh, across Asia, Pacific, Africa, and Latin America. We were deeply involved in all of these markets, of course, uh, except Latin America. We worked with them closely in their Asia Pacific as well as Africa expansion projects, uh, where we helped in factory design, supply chain design, change management, driving efficiencies, and so on. Uh, so been very, very privileged to work with a, a number of these uh, clients on very prestigious engagements. Uh, that has also given us, it has also been an enriching learning experience for us uh, in this whole process of, uh, of discovering capabilities uh, and also internalizing knowledge on very new and unique areas. And here, Noman, we have been working with a number of prestigious names. Uh, a lot of these have been uh, long-standing partnerships where we work closely with the board and the management team in helping them to drive a very specific business agenda in the uh, you know space of efficiencies and shareholder wealth creation. We are accredited with ISAT, uh, which is an American uh, accreditation body uh, that recognizes excellence in terms of knowledge creation and also the, the knowledge courses we offer are recognized by ISAT. So that is also a, a, a significant uh, differentiator for those going through our learning process and our various certification programs that we offer. And we are partnered in the in the, in the case of demand driven. We are partnered with uh, Demand Driven Institute, uh, which is uh, uh, which is a pioneer in the space of uh, the demand driven supply chain systems, which I'm going to take you through in this uh, webinar. And also with uh, B2Ys, uh, who is doing a lot of exciting work in developing the uh, very seamless IT interface uh, to talk with uh, any of the existing ERP implementation seamlessly, uh, to be uh, able to facilitate the uh, implementation of the demand-driven inventory management system. And uh, at time permits, we can talk a little bit about what it does and so on. And demand-driven itself has seen an enormous surge. Uh, the epicenter, of course, has been Europe uh, and, uh, and North America, where it originated, where we are seeing a massive explosion in industries uh, embracing the demand-driven science. Uh, and I hope I have piqued your interest enough in terms of what demand-driven is. And uh, you know, I'm not going to take too much of your time in these introductory slides, uh, and I will jump right into the uh, the subject that we are assembled here to explore. Okay, on that note, let me uh, uh, let me jump into the uh, the actual content of the webinar. So, um, first things first, uh, you know, uh, I you know I was looking at the. Uh, the people who have signed up for the webinar and uh, sort of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of those our 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 good friends and uh, who have represented uh, organizations in very senior leadership positions. Uh, so one of the uh, uh, one of the ongoing debate that we have had with our clients over the years has been uh, how to preserve the shareholders' wealth. Uh, now this is uh, uh, perhaps this is this has been. Uh, uh, spoken uh, uh, far too often uh, in, in boardrooms uh, and almost all the management debate when we do the annual uh, strategy planning process or when we do our management reviews in the monthly, quarterly basis and so on. Now, uh, uh, Deloitte, Deloitte University Press uh, published this some years ago uh, where uh, they were studying the, the return on investment trend of industries uh, across the globe. Uh, this was okay more in the U.S. context, but you can of course broadband it globally. They found uh, something uh, very telling uh, that uh, the actual uh, return on investment uh, has been depleting over the last uh, 50 odd years time frame. So uh, just to put it in context, uh, the last 50 years time frame is when the global GDP, the net GDP of the globe, grew close to about tenfold. So this has been a time of explosive growth in global GDP and global output. But this has also been a time where the return on investment of private institutions or private industries uh, has actually depleted. So this is really a food for thought. Uh, and we will try to delve deeper into what has caused this depleting trend and how this can be reversed. 
if you talk to any ceo or any owner of a business large or small and if you ask them a simple question that are you making the amount of profit that you that you believe that you deserve that you rightfully deserve uh, usually you will get an answer that is uh, that is the opposite they will always say that we are not making as much profits as we believe we could be making so the actual profits are actually less than what they believe they are rightfully deserved profit which we can call as an entitlement profit so this is the area of concern i hope you will all agree with me on this so the area of concern is that the business is not generating as much profit as it truly believes that it deserves and there are many reasons why this happens they may say that this is because of market forces the customers are reducing the prices the suppliers are, are increasing their supply cost the overhead costs are growing at an unanticipated pace and so on and so forth but if you look at the going back to the question of roi there are two levers that determine a business's roi right the numerator clearly is the profit that it generates but the denominator is the capital that you invest in the business right so there is a problem on both ends on one hand the profits that the business generate depletes year on year and on the other hand the capital that the business needs to keep going keeps inflating year on year right this capital could be in the form of the property plant and equipment which is what we call as the fixed assets that we invest in the business and also a large part of the capital that we invest is what we call as a working capital which means the amount of money that you need to pump into the business in order to keep the business growing and often times this becomes uh, uh, this kind of falls in a bit of a blind spot for many businesses where they take for granted that in order to run the business you need to put money into it uh, you need to buy inventories and you need to uh, uh, you need to buy material and therefore you will end up with uh, you know uh, accounts payable accounts receivable and all of the levers that determine the your working capital but uh, often times you will find that the business <laughs> someone needs to mute please <laughs> often times the businesses end up with uh, investing in greater capital than what is absolutely essential or optimal for them to uh, run the show and we will go into why this happens right and the problems could be with efficiency or it could be with effectiveness efficiency simply means that are we running the business with the absolute minimal resources or are the absolute optimal resources that are needed to run the business and effectiveness simply means that are we fulfilling all the customer obligations without missing out any of the opportunities so the profit drivers are many as i mentioned that in today's webinar we are going to limit ourselves to number 2 which is the optimal working capital that means how can your business commit itself and maintain the optimal or the minimal working capital that is essential for the business to run without exceeding that and that has a direct impact on the return on investment because we know that's an important lever so what exactly is working capital i know some of our friends are from the accounting world and uh, you know perhaps this is one of the basic uh, uh, you know uh, levers or metrics that are uh, used to measure the efficiency of the business the so working capital for for all of the others uh, Uh, it's a very easy metric to understand working capital simply means your current assets i hope my writing is legible so working capital is simply current assets minus current liabilities so if you talk to the auditors they will say that your working capital gives you a health check of how healthy your industry is that means do you have enough current assets in order to fulfill your immediate liabilities the liabilities of course could be in terms of your short term debt in terms of your accounts payable and so on right so now we're going to look at the working capital in itself is a harmless little metric but if if that number swells year on year that means if the working capital committed to your business is growing year on year that's a worrying trend so what really is happening here so working capital uh, you know if you look at your current assets what exactly are your current assets Uh, your accounts receivable is one of the current assets uh, in terms of how much money you are due, due to receive the amount of money you have in the bank and a big part of your current asset also is the amount of inventories that you hold within your supply chain right so you may say that uh, okay the, this is our asset which means at some point we will monetize it but let's say you were to liquidate your business today the 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 mo most value erosion will happen 
when you try to liquidate your inventories because people will just buy them at scrap value for the most part uh, and in its in in reality unless it is quickly converted into cash by making a sale happen that asset is just on paper and therefore there has been a lot of debate in the recent years especially in the lean community uh, you may uh, you you may look up a lot of the topical debate in terms of how the accounting books were written right a lot of the accounting practices were written in the post world war 2 era or the general generally accepted accounting practices and so on and so forth where inventory is inherently uh, identified as an asset uh, because of the notion that you can sell and monetize it but the reality is people are questioning inventory may not be an asset at least not in all circumstances there are many many situations where inventory ends up being a liability and this is what we are questioning so is inventory an asset uh, or a liability when i ask this question usually to a room full of let's say people who come with accounting training they will immediately say inventory is an asset because that's what the textbook taught us but now people are more and more people are challenging this notion that inventory may not be an asset at least not in all circumstances inventory is actually a liability especially in situations where you have too much of it or in situations where you have too little of it where still you are not able to monetize it <clears throat> and another interesting debate we often have is when you talk about profit enhancers uh, people jump into the conclusion or people have a false notion that technology is the uh, technology is the cure for all their problems uh, and uh, i cannot uh, i lost count of how many discussions or debates we have had where repeatedly we disagree saying that technology cannot be the cure it could be an enabler at best Uh, but the methodology is where a lot of opportunity for improvement lies and this is a bit uh, you know counterintuitive for most people because we say okay today we are living in a world of gadgets uh, we have apps that solve different problems uh, and if you want to track your health there is an app for that or if you want to track your spending there is an app for that so more and more we have been conditioned to believe that a technology can solve any problem but if we don't and change the underlying process and methods that we follow in the business the technology is going to come only and exacerbate this problem in fact there was a gartner research done uh, on the number of failures of technology projects uh, you know erp and other major technology transformation projects and they found that the failure rate was an alarming uh, you know 80 odd percentage uh, if not more where the project failed to meet the business objective and often times people come back and ask the question that have we correctly defined what change we want to bring into the business what change we need to bring to our methodology uh, the way we approach the process and the way we execute the process once that bit is cleaned up then the technology can come and automate the workflow or make your vision towards a future state process a reality right so technology i am not for or against technology technology is just a way in which you can reduce human effort Uh, but the methodology is essential so today we're going to focus on methodology how you can implant in fact the the great gurus in supply chain often keep saying thoughtware before software which means unless we change our thinking unless we fundamentally break old habits and sign ourselves up for you know the neural linkages of new habits the technology is not going to solve anything so what are the changing rules of the business Uh, the customers have become more discerning and more demanding you will all agree that we are the most impatient generation probably the millennials and i don't know what's the generation that came after millennials i'm a millennial so uh, you know our generation is is generally very uh, impatient we want instant service uh, i remember my father telling in his day uh, when he booked a car or a, or a or a scooter he didn't mind waiting for a year and some case some cases more than a year and people had this pride of being on the wait list of buying a bajaj chetak in india or a premier padmini car in india uh, which used to take years to deliver and usually it would also be delivered uh, with some flaws and they would end up doing tinkering work uh, right out of the uh, right out of the showroom uh, when the vehicle is being delivered right so we are become more discerning we are not the generation that is willing to wait we want the highest level of service we want efficiency we want reliability uh, customer customer experience and quality and the product life cycles have gotten shorter where if you see the typical uh, example of a phone uh, you know the first iphone was launched not so long ago if you actually look at it in in a timeline perspective it was launched in 2007 and already it has come to the iphone what iphone 12 now uh, but it's not just 12 generations i think if you consider some of the other naming and so on i think about 15 or 16 iterations of the iphone have come up uh, or if not more 
uh, in the last 12 to 13 year time frame. So uh, maybe an annual product cycle or maybe that's getting shorter. In fact, there was an interesting case I was covering in another context where, uh, uh, you know, if you compare the Sony, uh, Sony versus Apple or iPhone story, uh, where Sony was uh, actually holding about 20 to 30 percent market share of smartphone uh, around the time the iPhone came up. And today, Sony has more or less shut down its cell phone division. I think they own less than little more than 0% of the market share. And a big factor being their inability to keep pace with the product development cycle or the speed of product development uh, that Apple has been able to manage. And the variety has exacerbated. So this is another reason where if you talk to the supply chain planners, uh, you often get the pushback saying that, oh, we have to deal with so much variety. Recently, we were doing some work with uh, the catering uh, industry and uh, we were looking at some of their inventory performance and uh, some of the issues are so uh, pressing like when you talk about milk powder for example which they use for different sites for uh, you know, for their catering sites and within milk powder itself there are so many sources there are suppliers from india there are suppliers from uh, local suppliers there are suppliers from other parts of the world and you are constantly trying to identify the one that can give you the best price uh, the best uh, best uh, delivery lead times and therefore you may the same product you will have four or five different SKUs uh, that you will have to manage and you also make sure that you're not overshooting in terms of your inventory cover. So the planner's life is not easy today. Uh, in fact, uh, there was an interesting uh, analogy about the toothpaste industry. Somebody was trying to compare how many varieties of uh, Colgate toothpaste existed in the 1970s and versus how many exist today. Uh, you'll be surprised that in the 1970s, there was only one variety of Colgate toothpaste. You had just one variant, right? And today you have about 17 different varieties of Colgate toothpaste and they are adding more as we speak. So a simple product like toothpaste has had a 17 fold increase in terms of variety and complexity. And you can multiply that by so many other products and, uh, you know, that are sold uh, today. Uh, so customers want variety uh, and at the same time, they don't want to wait to get so this is what makes the planner's life even more difficult. And if you see the surge of e-commerce, especially during the uh, during the pandemic, uh, there has been a huge surge in e-commerce. In fact, I think 2020 was the best reported year in terms of revenue growth for Amazon. And you have seen what the share the share prices of Amazon and other e-commerce players has uh, done in the recent years. Uh, but it has also been an immensely challenging year, even for the likes of Amazon, who you can say that potentially has infinite resources and deep pockets. Uh, in fact, there was uh, there was an article going around some months ago that Amazon actually was reducing the features it was offering uh, on its websites. It was actually uh, forcing the customers to choose uh, bit, to offer fewer choices to customers uh, because they were overwhelmed with, with the surge in, in demand uh, that they could not handle the kind of volumes and the same day delivery commitments that they were making to customers. So they were turning off a few features on the website to prompt the customers other choices and varieties and so on. And therefore they could to some extent contain uh, the, uh, the, the manic uh, surge in customer demand and variety that the customers were ordering. So uh, the world has gotten uh, crazy uh, within quotes uh, and, and more and more industries are trying to uh, play catch up in terms of how do you efficiently manage the variety that you offer to customers and meet the customer demand 100% reliably and on time. So uh, I think I have said enough to kind of set the stage for the challenges that we have faced over the, uh, you know, over the years, over the recent years and the more exacerbated challenges in the last one or two year time frame, especially the last one year time frame. I remember we did a similar webinar about a year ago uh, on the very same topic and one would have never imagined that one year later we are still talking about uh, the pandemic and its fallout effects uh, and, and the craziness that's going around us. So enter demand-driven science and what is the rationale for demand-driven MRP and how it aims uh, to tackle some of these burning issues. At least it introduces a very, very scientific approach that can give the planners a potent weapon in order to deal with some of the challenges that we face. So, um, you know, again, we are still on the subject of the working capital and how you can build enabling processes and methods uh, that can give the planners an ability to deal with the vagaries of customer demand, right? So the demand-driven science, in a sense, is not entirely new. Uh, it builds on the pillars of the, the foundational principles of, uh, of Lean. 
uh, on the pr pillars of Six Sigma theory of constraints and various other uh, principles that have come before it. So the authors of Demand Driven do not claim that uh, this is an idea that uh, that just popped up and it's completely uh, it completely goes against the grain of traditional evolution of operations management science. Uh, if I were to just reflect, and I, perhaps some of you are introduced to some of these principles, like lean theory of constraints and Six Sigma and so on, um, and not going into each one of them. Six Sigma, for instance, uh, it, it talks about minimizing variation. So if you have a process that has a variation, uh, that could be in terms of a manufacturing process or it could be a transactional process. Wherever there is variation, Six Sigma aims to minimize the variation, therefore making the process more, uh, more in tune with the target level of performance, right? So demand-driven science is also aiming for a similar objective or a similar true north objective where it aims to minimize variation or variability in your process. What about principles of lean? Lean simply talks about eliminating waste. Waste could be in the form of transport, inventory, motion, and so on and so forth. We call it seven or eight, for eight forms of waste. So lean simply says that eliminate waste in your process and make your process so streamlined that with the absolute minimum resources, you are able to fulfill end customer demand. Right? For those of you interested in the, in the lean story and how it evolved in Toyota and so on, there is a wonderful book that I picked up on last year. It's called as the, uh, the Toyota Production System. Uh, it literally is the Toyota Production System uh, by Taichi Ono, who is uh, considered to be the father of lean manufacturing systems. And he wrote this book, of course, in Japanese uh, back in the 80s, I think a few years before his passing. And this book was translated in English, and it's a fascinating read. A lot of the fables that we hear about lean and Toyota production system, uh, it it debunks a number of you know urban legends about the subject. Uh, but it also it also is a very straight uh, you know honest to goodness uh, version of how lean evolved at Toyota and what problems they were trying to solve at Toyota uh, in order to uh, and what led to the development of the Toyota production system. Uh, among many things, one of the objectives it aims is that. Can you can you deliver 100% to end customer demand with absolutely minimal resources that you invest in your business? The resources could be in the form of, uh, of course, inventory and, and working capital that you invest in your business. Also, in, in terms of how much land you commit, uh, in terms of your factory facilities uh, and storage facilities and so on and so forth. The true not that Lean pursues is that achieve 100% service levels to customer with absolutely minimal resources that are necessary for you to fulfill. And this is how Toyota differentiated itself. And theory of constraints is another very interesting science. The, the book goal was more written as a, uh, as a, as a fable uh, or an or a, or a anecdote in terms of how you pursue the, the true north objective of flow. And it simply says that, uh, you know, how do you achieve throughput, which is meeting 100% end customer demand, and how do you create flow by suitably managing your resources, especially your constraint resources. So that brings us to the Plossel's Law. Uh, Plossel's Law is a very simple but uh, you know eye-opening um, uh, way to put it. Plossel's Law simply says that the return on investment is a function of flow. So what do you mean by flow? Any business exists for the simple reason uh, to, to, to fulfill a customer need, right? If, if, you, if you take a, a contrarian view, if you, if you look at your business and say that, what is the purpose for my business to exist? Why should a customer come to me and pay money for, for receiving from me my product or service? Right? Uh, you will get a very startling revelation. That means uh, uh, the customer comes to you because you're creating a value. You're solving a problem for the customer. And therefore, the business that gets really good at solving that problem for the customer consistently is a business that we say is creating flow. So flow could be in the context of a, of a trading or a, or a manufacturing firm. If you're producing a product, the flow simply means that that product is available for the customer 100% of the time the customer needs it, right? If you're in a service business, it again means the same thing. You could be a healthcare diagnostic center, which today is, is the need of the hour. What is the what is flow in your business? It simply means that every time a customer has a need to, to get him himself or herself checked, they, are, they show up at the facility and everything happens like clockwork without waiting, without delays, and the customer gets the service they came to pay money for. That's what flow means. So technically, if your business has 100% flow, your business should be able to generate a very high return on investment, right? That means you are able to monetize every single customer requirement without missing a beat, right? So you will say that 
but this is not the case in most most instances in most instances instances we have a challenge in in meeting customer demand and therefore we leads to customer attrition and so on and so forth right so what are the hin potential hindrances to flow there are two reasons why the flow may be hindered one simply because of the flow of material which is how do you move widgets within your factory or how do you move things within your supply chain or distribution network and the second often ignored element of flow is how do you flow information right because information is not visible it's not tangible you can't touch and feel information simply means that the customer says i need a product i need it on such and such date and how do you process that information so that you are telling your suppliers when they should supply or ship the material to you you are telling your planners when this should be executed in your factory and you are telling your factory when this should be ready in a finished good form that you can supply to the customer so this has gotten more and more complex right the industries are not like a vending machine where you where you put a coin and you get the product that you need industries are so much more complex which means a lot of information needs to be processed to understand when the customer needs what he needs and to communicate that to suppliers to hold them to account for the right delivery performance and to flow them within the factory without any delays or defects this is where the complexity has caught up and more and more industries are playing catch up uh, rather than leading the uh, uh, leading the charge in terms of creating flow so how does the mrp and ddmrp science help here in fact this science is not new uh, joe orlicky who is considered to be the father of the material requirement planning or mrp uh, actually wrote this he coded this in the 1950s so he was a guy very ahead of his time uh his vision was that is there a way i can create is there a way i can create a a, a simple uh, a simple calculator by which the moment i know what the customer wants and when they want it i should be able to translate that into what are the things i need to buy and when do i need to produce and in how much units that i need to produce right it makes it makes perfect logical sense so customer says i need 100 units of product a and for that i need a raw material which should be supplied on a certain date it should be manufactured on a certain date so that the 100 units of the product is made available to the customer on the date that he has asked for it right so there was no way in which this can be done elegantly therefore he thought of a simple way to break down the requirement into bill of material and how this is translated into uh, into the uh, sequence of dates in which the material needs to be shipped manufactured and delivered to the customer but you will be surprised in the 1950s uh, the computing power did not exist right so therefore there was no way uh, a computer program could be written to translate the simple material requirement planning which we take for granted into a execution system but uh, uh, but this of course changed in the 1970s uh, ibm developed the mainframe computers and now they had the computing power uh, to be able to uh, to be able to make mrp as a working system and uh, and it has gone through its own stages but now you can imagine the 1970s as 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 evidenced by the colgate example that i gave was a relatively simple era where the supply chains were not as elongated they were closer to one another uh, the most of the uh, most of the companies sourced locally the customer demand was fairly stable and predictable and the varieties offered were fairly simple and minimal and therefore the system could work it could work in situations where the end customer demand is stable and the date in which the customer asked for the product is does not change right so he made two very important assumptions that the end customer demand is stable and the customer asking uh, the date in which the customer asked the product does not change it's not a moving target but both these assumptions don't hold good today we are living in a world where customer demand is crazy it changes by the minute by the hour and the customer also is moving the requirement date closer and closer like today amazon is making a commitment that uh, it wants to uh, it, it is already delivering more than 70 to 80% of its uh, of its shipment on the same day delivery right and it is aiming to achieve 100% same day delivery in the very very not so distant future right so both of these assumptions of stability as well as predictability of lead time has changed and therefore mrp as a science also needs to evolve with the time and this is where the principles of demand driven uh, aim to add a layer of sophistication to material requirement planning so what what exactly material requirement planning system is it simply says moment you know what the customer wants when they need it 
uh, that will translate into the master schedule and that will also translate into what is manufactured in the shop floor and when and therefore we know that when to procure and when to supply to end customer demand right so it's a simple engine that drives end customer demand and translate into what is needed when it is needed and in what sequence it should be delivered to the customer so the mrp science uh, needed an overhaul and it had to be rethought uh, by preserving the core elements of mrp uh, which is great and we are not fundamentally changing or challenging the core element of mrp but we definitely want to add a layer of sophistication that can help the mrp engine uh, to stay relevant in tune with the modern day challenges so uh, carol and chad are the pioneers of demand driven uh, you know uh, i had a uh, you know uh, um, you know interaction with them some some years ago and uh, we were quite fascinated by the work they were doing and we believed that uh, this science has to be brought uh, to the the part of the world that we work in and that's when we reached out to them to to be a part of the demand driven network uh, over the last year and a half to time frame we have been actively involved and in promoting the demand driven science and what exactly the demand driven science uh, aims to do uh, it goes back to the fundamental question of how you can maximize rop Uh, by building flow in your supply chain practices so just to reiterate the concept of nervousness the customer tolerance time is, is short which means that the customer uh, is impatient today so the sales order visibility is a very short time horizon and we cannot operate 100% just by reacting to end customer demand because we have a longer time fr time frame to manufacture and a much longer time frame to procure so today no supply chain can claim to operate Uh, with zero inventory anywhere so people will say that uh, oh in order to be uh, reflexive or in order to be efficient are you recommending that we actually stock more um, i think it's a little bit of a vain argument because uh, today i have not come across a single industry that is either in a made to stock or even in a made to order environment that is operating with zero inventories right that would be the ideal true north and taichi ono ono will be very proud in his grave Uh, if he sees that an industry is operating with zero inventory because that is what they visualized as a true north objective in toyota in fact when they defined the toyota production system one of the things that you know if you were to really simplify it for a common man's understanding they will say that the toyota production system simply aims to sell one make one and buy one that means you know exactly when the customer wants an item how many they want it and therefore you are able to make it available magically when it is needed and once you have made that sale you will make the second component and make it ready and you will make the part available for the third component now this is a true north ideal which no industry including toyota has been able to achieve it maybe when we move to the world of 3d printing where you can make infinite skus with just a bag full of resin and a printing machine you can probably live in that world where you don't have inventories and only you will manufacture only after the customer has placed an order to very specific customer uh, customer needs but we don't live in that world maybe that world is maybe not so far uh, not as far out in the future as we would like to imagine uh, but we haven't yet gotten there we are still living in a world where the customer has a limited tolerance for lead time they don't want to wait and uh, we have to manage a potential infinite variety of demand by the end customer and we have to manage that by either by um, a longer lead time manufacturing activity and a much longer lead time procurement activities so how do we achieve that right how do we achieve that without uh, significantly increasing our working capital but at the same time by thoughtfully managing the way our supply chain and inventory replenishment system uh, reacts or rather responds to the vagaries of end customer demand so the customer demand is crazy as we know the demand driven system has aimed to decode this in a very simple three stage process what they call as the position protect and uh, pull which simply means that if you can thoughtfully place a strategic inventory buffer what we call a strategic decoupling um, in a way that it gives us an immediate protection against the vagaries of end customer demand and you are dynamically managing your inventory position so that it responds or it rather flexes in tune with variation of end customer demand and it's a fascinating science and uh, and it you will see that if for those of us who come from a, a lean tradition uh, inventory buffers are not new uh, although one may uh, take a very idealist view saying that lean says zero inventory 
uh, unless you achieve zero inventory you cannot be lean uh, i disagree and lot of the modern writings on the subject disagree in fact richard schonberger did a a, a multi year study it's available uh, you can google this up Uh, uh by richard schonberger who is uh, again a very very respected author and and writer on this subject and he wrote a, a a series of white paper on studying the inventory turnover performance of the automotive industry the electronics industry and so on over the years and his study revealed that actually the industry's uh, inventory turnover even the supposedly well run industries inventory turnover has worsened over the years that means he concurs with the view that most industries have had to resort to increasing their inventory position as against decreasing because they have not been able to catch up with the vagaries of customer demand and the supply chain challenges that have been exacerbated in recent years so one cannot argue against the need for placing inventory as a buffer but if you are placing inventory as a buffer how thoughtfully that buffer is placed so that you are not exceeding the inventory more than what is required to achieve flow at the same time you are not caught with a situation with too little inventory where you are missing the opportunity to make a sale and therefore you are depleting your ability to create flow and return on investment managing that thoughtfully or intelligently is what the ddmrp science is all about so on one hand positioning simply means that you don't want to keep a buffer of items which is not needed and this could and, and of course we have had discussions where we have gone through a list of uh, potentially 300000 skus that are stored in a spare part uh, supply chain or maybe 200 skus that are stored in a catering supply chain it doesn't matter the the variety in itself is not a source of complexity the source of complexity really is when you break it down in terms of you know item wise how much over engineering we do in terms of you know racking our brains spending endless nights sleepless nights going over uh, you know pouring over number of excel sheets with the hope that there is no error crept into the formula in those excel sheets and then you know trying to chase multiple sources chasing after cost efficiencies opportunistic buying efficiencies the amount of burden that is on the planners today is unprecedented right if you simply take that burden away from the planners and give them a very simplified tool by which they can do their inventory planning that in itself is a massive saving for most industries to avoid the burnout situation that most of the planners are going through so the simple concept is once you place your strategic buffer and you have to make sure that the buffer protects you in that position suppose you place a buffer if you are if you are a company that is trading in parts and you have kept a strategic inventory buffer of those traded parts you have to make sure that a basic intelligence is built into the buffer so that it flexes because demand is not stable today right you will have an item that sold 100 units last month but it may sell 300 units next month it could be because organically the demand has grown or or maybe it is because of seasonality for example if you look at the food industries or the fmcg industry every time they ramp up their volumes before ramadan because they know that during the ramadan month the sales peak in terms of these uh, the food products and various other things and right after ramadan and the eid holidays it again normalizes so this is a known phenomenon right so you cannot be in a situation where you commit yourself to a certain inventory buffer and then you come to a seasonality of demand and the buffer remains static and it's no longer giving you protection therefore you need to build an element of intelligence into the buffer so that it flexes when the demand grows and it depletes when the demand reduces without having to engineer it you cannot do this at an item level by relying on the planner's intelligence right the planners are bright people nothing against them but the amount of burden there is on the planners to go item by item and to increase or decrease they are ordering based on uh, seasonality and so on it's a enormous burden that we want to free them up from right so this is one aspect and uh, the uh, other aspect is you want to create visibility and a collaborative execution so what this means is that uh, the visibility simply means that uh, the planners need to be able to see a one voice in terms of how the system operates and therefore they need to be able to then decide jointly in terms of what actions they are going to take are they going to order an item are they going to stop ordering an item are they going to let the inventory run down because a new item is going to be introduced and so on and so forth all of these need to be vis visible today a uh, most organization this information is buried in tons and tons of excel spreadsheets so if if the planner goes on leave for a day you will find that the whole system collapses because there is no one else who knows what is to be done and therefore this becomes extremely people dependent and therefore a huge risk for the organization right and therefore we want to make the system that is simple and visible 
so that you are actually de-skilling the process so that the planners and the buyers uh, can spend their time on more value adding tasks which could be trying to find alternative sources local sources renegotiating prices those are the things that bring value to the organization not in terms of chasing after the vagaries of demand which may go up and down in and in different directions right so that's really the principle of the demand driven science uh, i think i overshot a couple of my slides i realized uh, my colleague ganesh will come in here and he's going to take us through some of the uh, some of his experiences of driving demand driven science and more specifically specifically in the context of some of the industries uh, that he has had the privilege to uh, work with uh, ganesh over to you thank thank you navin uh, let me just share my screen and make sure it is visible so is the screen visible navin now uh yes all right uh so very quickly uh, so this is a case study of a, a lighting industry uh, where they were manufacturing this was an uh, tire one supplier to oem where they were manufacturing led lightings and variety of led lightings uh, that is the organization which we were looking at so they manufacture batons or tube lights panels uh, professional you know street lighting or uh, other kind of lighting and they were catering to brands such as um, you know like uh, Crompton Greaves and Philips and others they were doing uh, package products Cisco and other things in India so that was the context of the company uh, what they were manufacturing so how the our current system uh, was operating uh, was on the basis of there is a forecast and this is as is we'll see this kind of a system in any uh, organization there is a forecast uh, based on inputs from sales and marketing uh, which is primarily driven by the oem so the oem uh, would give a rolling forecast for 3 months but they may change the next month forecast at the last minute uh, and then uh, they have to change as per that Uh, that would trigger the procurement of materials based on the forecast what is given the production planning and uh, control schedules every section so they had various sections within the factory uh, there was a led section there was a, a, where the led gets on to the batons there was a, a plastic uh, extrusion division which was doing the all the moldings and other things which are required to support the led fixture so there were different uh, areas and everything had to combine together in the final assembly and then deliver the fi finished product to the uh, end customer so there's a huge coordination effort led by ppc saying that depending on the lead times of different operations what has to be done where and how do you deliver uh, it in right time in the required quantity to the end uh, customer so the bigger challenge was the linkage to the actual customer demand was not very well which meant that they were holding lots of inventory since led is a standard item and uh, uh, the number of varieties which they held and the runner items which they had uh, that was different so they were holding a lot of inventory and as anybody says inventory basically you hold inventory when you lack information so when the information is not clear and the flow across the system is not clear, clear from sales marketing right up to uh, planning for production planning and control then what happens is you buffer everywhere with enough inventory so that any change which comes you are able to cater to it and you are never stopped out so the steps which we took in this organization uh, typical uh, the five step approach which we talked about uh, in the ddi mrp approach strategic inventory positioning buffer profiling dynamic adjustments and demand driven planning and then the final visible collaborative execution we went through these steps so what happens in the uh, so when you look at your uh, uh, sq you have a fg strategy or a, F, a finished good product in which you have different models of uh, products and these models are typically you would categorize them as either made to stock or made to order a typical made to stock item would be something which is being consumed uh, very predictably and you know how much demand is going to be there every month on month at least in the next visible 3 to 6 months you have the uh, you have the visibility into that a made to order could be a customized uh, institutional order a large order 
for a private organization which is coming in so that would be a completely made to made to order scenario on the fgs similarly on the rm uh, we have strategies in terms of whether you want to do a milk run which means that it's it's something like a consumable uh, as and when required you get the materials uh, uh, that is what we typically call as a milk run where a uh, van goes around to your suppliers collects all the materials and comes in uh, you could procure to stock which means that these are items which are uh, coming or uh, either you're importing it or high value items or you make uh, you make a, a procurement decision based on opportunistic pricing then these are typically procured to stock and the last one uh, could be procured on order which means that only on a special case basis or as and when the uh, uh, inventory uh, uh, is being required at that time you would order to these rms so the first step is also what we did uh, prior to the uh, getting into the steps of ddmrp is analyze the demand patterns on both the uh, finished goods and the raw materials to categorize to saying that which items are which skus are uh, are likely to be put into our system and which items should we look at uh, ca- categorizing as a phase 1 and a phase 2 so that the system uh, belief gets implemented easier are uh, demonstrated and then gets uh, implemented across the whole organization so when you look at it from a predictability point of view you see that you know the number of skus and the demand which is there you see the uh, the, the first two uh, ones the normal and erratic these two number of skus probably contributing to about 5% skus contributing to over 54% of the demand so this kind of gives you an indication of saying that uh where is my demand really there uh, how many skus are really contributing to it and where do i really need to focus my attention uh and if this 50% is on autopilot mode that means i don't need to bother about it then i can concentrate this is where what navin was saying that what planners need to concentrate on and focus on becomes uh, very easy when you start implementing the ddmrp system so when we get into the made to stock or made to order strategic decision we identified which of these are uh, the things so we use a, a software solution called fred analysis to help uh, in this whole uh, analysis of the demand classes based on past historical data and then the decision is made on this the first step of the ddmrp when we talked about strategic inventory positioning uh, what this step essentially does is you talk about the where before the uh how much so you know people typically say that in inventory planning you need to decide how much inventory but uh, before you get into how much inventory you need to decide where do you want to keep the inventories so uh, do you want to keep all the items in finished good uh, navin gave a example in the fmcg industry it may make sense to have your inventories in uh, in uh, in made to made to stock kind of a scenario in the fg and similarly in this scenario what in the lighting you had items which are made to stock 50% which fell into that category and 50% which are falling into a made to order or another kind of uh, uh, the categories so then identifying where which sku should be stocked either in a fg or a semi finished or a raw material those decisions are being done in the strategic inventory positioning based on that you get to the next step once you identified where the inventories are you decide what is the ideal quantity that you would want to have this is where the second step of buffer profiling comes which says that uh, defining the red green and yellow zones for each and every sku is what the buffer profiling does it says that what is your stock out alert levels what is your uh, level at which you need to uh, reorder the uh, uh, items for your raw material at which time you should do a production run for a particular item those decisions help uh, start coming out from your buffer profiling this is which you get this kind of uh, so we developed this in a simple excel model where the stock norms were defined and then depending on those buffer profiles we were able to identify uh, how do we keep uh, how do we keep track of these adjustments whether we have sufficient stock of these Uh, whether these are in level or not so 
keeping track, making frequent adjustments to buffer the levels, aligning to the market demand as and when the demand goes up, then what happens is the stock goes down and then the uh, uh, alert goes on to the shop floor. So you are becoming more and more agile, more and more uh, leaner uh, in the context in terms of to meet the market demand. Uh, when we get into the planning level, uh, this is where the activity of the planner comes in on a daily basis. So what should be produced, what should be, pro be procured? These are the two aspects of planning and procurement work hand in hand uh, and uh, to ensure that whether all the required materials uh, are there for preparing the item. And second is all the raw materials should be available from a procurement point of view. So both of these planning, when we look at it, both from a manufacturing side and from a procurement level, the system covers both of this. And uh, pr primarily what it is called is a buffer penetration report. So how much of my stock buffer is being consumed? Uh, looking at that and then deciding either should I uh, replenish that or not. So that's the kind of a decision uh, which comes up very visibly. And then so what happens is the planners and the PPC folks need to only focus on the red SKUs, you know, saying that, okay, now I need to focus on these three which have to be made. Uh, and then you can start looking at deep diving into that level of uh, SKU. Last, coming to the visible and collaborative execution. So uh, this, when this uh, uh, dashboard was made available all across the platform, what it also helped is this PPC scheduling various sections, the number of uh, alerts which have to be got in terms of how the inventory keeps moving on a daily basis, basis what is being produced or what is not required to produce. Uh, and then uh, trying to give the right signals to each section. So every section uh, has to schedule itself based on this same report, which is made available across the organization. So it is not that you know each one is making their own Excel sheets and uh, doing their own planning of, of their uh, parts, but it is about trying to collaboratively work and then trying to execute as for that. So this was uh, a simple example where we worked in terms of defining, creating a system. Uh, another example which I would quickly touch base on is the uh, ceiling fan manufacturing. I won't take much time. I know that we are coming to the close of our timeline. But very quickly, this is another interesting example where we worked on the distribution side as well. So it was to understand both the uh, create a pull manufacturing system optimize RMFG inventory and optimize the working capital. That was the whole goal of this. So if you look at it, uh, when we started, uh, they had a distribution all across India with various depots in which they used to stock the items and this being a fast moving electrical good um, and having a high seasonal demand, which means that the summer season is where the demand kicks in. So they need to produce all across the other months uh, to create the inventory and then uh, manage uh, the three months of demand which is there. So we look at this whole demand and when we look at the inventory, we could see that what was the baseline in terms of uh, how much inventory was being held uh, and we look at it from an RM angle, how much inventory is there. So that was being set in terms of trying to identify how much uh, inventory is being kept. So the opportunity then came up from these two baselines and then getting onto the distribution side, uh, trying to identify, uh, you know, the goal was how do you make the dealerships, uh, any demand which comes from any dealer should be serviced within 24 hours. So that was the whole idea. So when we look at the whole distribution centers, where they are uh, across the country, where our uh, uh, manufacturing centers are, which is where what we call the mother hub, and then it distributes regionally to the distribution centers and then on to the dealers. So when we look at all of this, so we had to look at what were the, how this whole uh, uh, model is being designed and what new areas were required which were unserviceable within 24 hours, where we had multiple depots servicing in some areas, then uh, trying to consolidate those also, and then come up with a, a very scientific method in which the demand can actually flow right up to the mother depot to give the uh, production plan for uh, what should be produced and what should not be manufactured. So uh, earlier it was completely on the basis of the forecast which was given. 
So you are changing the system from a completely forecast driven to an actual consumption driven pattern and trying to look at uh, how, which item, which SKU, which style is actually having a larger demand and then trying to build the system for it. So as and when the depots were consuming it, the regional uh, depots would have the uh, have the demand for it, basis with the mother warehouse would have a demand and that would go to the factory. And then finally, that would translate into the bomb and back to the suppliers. So this whole system was uh, uh, developed and implemented through which the whole leaning of the system happened. So again, uh, whether decision is to make, whether should we transfer from a nearby warehouse if there is uh, ability, all of those were something which were designed as part of the system in terms of decision making uh, quantity to transfer and uh, what is the priority, what is the urgency, all of this was put into the design of the system and then developed. So these are just few samples of uh, what was being done as part of the production planning and the procurement planning. The end result is, as you can see, the availability of the SKU, the finished good availability, moved up steadily from uh, 50 to 60 percent when we started to over 90 percent, reaching a peak of 98 percent uh, of availability, which meant that the SKUs which are required or demanded by the dealers are may, are available in the depots in, in the nearby locations within one day. Uh, the second thing is on the RM side, you can see a steady decrease in the level of inventories uh, from the months we started to when we uh, left. So from a 21 days, the inventory was brought down to 31.5. This resulted in a net working capital availability of USD 5 million uh, and interest cost saving on an annual basis would be around 300,000 USD. So that is what we'd want to end with. Uh, in terms of saying that this whole science of DDMRP is uh, being provided by the Demand Driven Institute and what SSA offers is uh, various uh, training programs to help change the mindset as, in, as Naveen said, you need to change the thoughtware before you can uh, implement any technology change or anything. Start uh, uh, believing in the new process. So we have Demand Driven Leader Program, Demand Driven Planner Program. Uh, adaptive SNOP process, uh, and then we have a one-day uh, event wherein uh, we have a simulation which we play in this uh, DD Bricks. That's what it's called. So these are all, uh, and DD Bricks comes from our partner B2Wise, uh, and uh, these programs help to invest in the people to bring about the knowledge change, the mindset change which is required to meet the changing demand patterns. So with that, over to you, Naveen. Thank you, Ganesh. Uh, I think uh, we are almost uh, out of time. Uh, actually, maybe just one slide. So we have an upcoming uh, uh, we have an upcoming uh, program or uh, demand uh, DDMRP Foundation program that we are planning on 17th and 18th of May. Uh, my colleague uh, Sunny is putting this together. Uh, it's going to be taught online. And it's a great uh, uh, immersion into DDMRP. We are going to deep dive into uh, some of the uh, some of the you know principles underlying DDMRP, some of the calculations, how do you set it up, and also take you through some of the uh, Excel sheets and so on, which which potentially uh, to give you a sort of an immersion uh, that could uh, help help to one build the foundational knowledge for those uh, maybe the leaders who are looking to bring demand driven science into their organization, or also your managers who may be uh, candidates. Uh, who can uh, learn these principles and also make it uh, uh, make it a way of life. So this is happening on 17th and 18th of May. Uh, you can uh, touch base with Sunny uh, and he can share more details of how to sign up and so on. So that really brings us to the end of what we had in store to present uh, this morning. Uh, I don't know if it gives us some time to uh, have uh, have some Q and A. Uh, uh, you know. I think, uh, Sunny, I hope the chat is uh, not uh, disabled for people. I think if they are participant, they are they cannot they cannot type in the chat. So if you could allow them to uh, uh, chat or if it's possible to let people to uh, permit to chat, uh, that will be great. Uh, there may be some uh, 
Sure. Questions? Uh, uh, we are happy to take some sure. questions in the next five, ten minutes. Or if uh, if you're struggling with your chat, then I'm happy to. You can unmute and speak also if any one of you has any questions. I'll just wait for uh, the next uh, uh, you know few minutes. If there are no questions, I will end it. Okay, great. Some questions are coming up. How is okay? Okay, good. <laughs> First one. Uh, how is the DDMRP applicable for largely trading companies in uh, Middle East scenario? Okay, great question. I'm, I'm glad someone uh, brought that up. Uh, Ganesh, would you like to give it a go uh, in terms of trading environment? How DDMRP can apply? And then maybe I can supplement that uh, your your answer. Sure, and I will uh, have Alan also pitch in here. You could unmute him also. Uh, so uh, you know, so I think. Uh, 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 some of the experiences, I'm, I'm, I'm talking from the experiences of Alan, uh, where they did a similar exercise with an online uh, uh, platform. Okay, So this is uh, something like an Amazon equivalent in South Africa, where uh, what they were doing is they, they were just providing a platform for trading. right? So oh, these e-commerce e is nothing but a trading platform. And where they applied the DDMRP principles into saying that how do you plan uh, which goods have to be stocked in your warehouses and which are not to be stocked? Which are your fast-moving items? Which items do you need to discount on? How do you create these uh, uh, policies on, okay, does a discount, if we apply a discount, is it really working, not working? So getting into those vagaries of managing a, a trading organization's requirements is completely supported within a DDMRP environment. Does that uh, help answer the question, Ramesh? Yeah, uh, great, uh, Ganesh. Uh, uh, just to add uh, to 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 your uh, uh, answer, I think uh, the uh, uh, trading environments from whatever we have experienced in this uh, region uh, is, uh, you know, one is they are bound by the uh, you know the pressure from their principles uh, in terms of uh, you know in terms of payment terms and also in terms of uh, the uh, giving the firm orders in time to secure the supplies. And of course, the customers is a moving target because they, you know, in terms of delivery commitments and in terms of cost and other things. So the trading firms are usually caught in between both of these stakeholders. And uh, usually this is where they are constantly, you know, in the demand driven world, what we call as a, a bimodal distribution, where you're caught with too much inventories or too little inventories. You know, sometimes you place an order anticipating a huge demand and then the demand dies off or you're, so you're caught in a situation where you have an opportunity, but if you don't supply that opportunity in time, it's going to go to someone else and so on. So they're always caught between this challenge. And in fact, there's a lot of, uh, you know, undocumented loss of business, uh, you know, which may be significant. Uh, so if, if you know, you can truly take out that variation in your, uh, in your inventory position, uh, it gives a massive edge in order to, you know, reliably meet customer demand without overshorting inventory position in a trading environment. So it's definitely a, a massive advantage there. Uh, so, Alan, do you want to pitch in with uh, your insights? Yes, happy to. Hi, hi everyone. I'm yeah. Alan van Furen from B2Ys. Um, we have multiple clients that have zero manufacturing in their organization. So, so not even any form of assembly or kitting. It's 100% it's um, trading business where they're buying from a combination of local suppliers as well as long lead time international suppliers. Um, and they've implemented the methodology with, with great success. Um, and I believe the main reason for that is it's, it's the visual nature of the methodology, the fact that everyone can very clearly identify the same way um, Naveen had a slide earlier. I think um, I think it was Naveen where it was produce or don't produce. That just becomes do I buy or do I not buy and how much should I be buying? And then how do I move that through my distribution network? And it's easy to understand. And the planners in the business are reacting to those signals every day rather than in these um, typically monthly buckets where we say, this is what we think we're going to sell next month, place the order once, and we bring that in. Um, and then we, we we try and figure out at that point, where do we put it? And there's a lot of effort that goes into, into completing that. And, and a lot of the time, it's a lot of guesswork. It's now a very structured, easy to follow model 
um, that they get a lot of benefit out of. And I think um, the the ones an online retailer, the other ones a commercial catering supplier. Um, we have another business which is a um, agricultural supplier. So multiple instances of that sort of supply chain. Perfect. Thanks, Alan. Fantastic. So great, Alan. Alan, by the way, is from our partner firm B Two Wise, and he. He uh, kindly joined in today, which was a pleasant surprise. So great that you could join, Alan. Um, so there are one or two other good questions. Questions uh, one on the software, which <laughs> is a segue to the, you know, the first question we addressed. Do you need a, uh, you know, can you build this logic into Excel, or do you need a software program to run DDMRP? Uh, I think a good question, uh, Naveen. Uh, uh, this is something that often comes up. And the way I look at if I if I want to take the uh, the uh, you know um, you know the bias out of the uh, question, I would I would look at so people need to embrace the science first, right? Which means that they need to first of all understand uh, what the science is all about, uh, learn the basic principles and tools required to implement DDMRP. That is crucial. Uh, it is something like learning to drive a car, right? Just because uh, you fancy owning a car, you can't just, you know, you, if you have the money, of course, you can buy the car, but, uh, you know, you, it is still, you are still not allowed to drive the car on the road because you don't have the skills to drive the car, right? So it is something like that. You need to learn DDMRP. You need to acquire the skills for the DDMRP science. Uh, you know, learn at least the basic calculations, how they work, and more importantly, why they work and so on. Once you have a grip on that knowledge, which uh, basic Excel tools about one or two more questions and say, um, when the dependence on OEM is high and trading company can't influence them on delivery prioritization, how DDMRP will work for trading? I think we addressed the question on trading, so I will go to another question where we will talk about... Uh, uh, you know, some other uh, issues and context. So let's say, uh, does DDMRP work for all business models? Where, where is it less or more effective? Okay, that's again a great question. Ashish uh, is an old friend of ours. Uh, good, thanks for the question, Ashish. Uh, maybe, uh, Ganesh, would you like to uh, take that one? Does DDMRP work for all business models? Where is it less or more effective is the question. Uh, uh, I, will, uh, I will definitely say that it works with all business models, but when you look at the effectiveness of the results point of view is a function of how much uh, of inventory uh, is the burden today, right? So, so the benefit from the DDMRP system would come when the burden of the working capital, the burden of the inventory, the burden of planning is too high to manage in the current system or the current MRP system, uh, uh, what typically comes with the standard ERP, the way in which it runs. Uh, and it creates or increases the um, uh, the bulbip effect across the uh, chain of things. So uh, I would say that unless we study, there's, there's no one answer to say that, okay, uh, it, it will work or it will not work. It's not as easy to say that. But unless we study the system uh, and uh, validate the benefits, it's hard to say that, okay, whether uh, it is more effective or less effective for a given kind of a system. Right. G uh, great, uh, great, uh, Ganesh. So uh, again, I just to second that, uh, the, the, as a system, it's agnostic to what your business and, and what your industry does and fulfilling that demand. Uh, DDMRP can uh, be the engine that drives your planning and execution process of fulfilling that demand. So in that sense, it applies to all business models. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the best way to know if, how relevant and how big a difference it makes to your particular industry is to actually uh, do a small pilot and to kind of give it a go, and you yourself will get a lot of uh, feedback about how the system uh, can help in your specific industry scenario. Uh, great, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Ashish. Uh, thank you, Lakshman. Thanks, everyone. Wonderful. I could probably just take one last question, and then we yeah. can wrap. Uh, so this is, a, this is an interesting one. Does the solution require implementation at key suppliers? when a customer intends to implement the solution or suppliers can be decoupled through inventory positioning and buffering? I think uh, this is, uh, Naveen, great question. Uh, maybe, Alan, would you like to take a stab at this one? Uh, in terms of, do you involve suppliers or you completely, uh, you know, just because you decouple them through inventory, uh, you you just keep them out of the equation for a DDMRP implementation? Um, 
I know typically the way clients will go about approaching this is they'll identify potentially a group of products supplied by a few key suppliers. And there's two schools of thought around this. They'll either take um, suppliers that are very reliable, that they have an existing relationship with, that they work well with, and they'll ring fence those products and um, start the implementation of those products. I'm, I'm more of a fan of the other approach where you take your most problematic suppliers, the suppliers that are really difficult to work with, very unreliable um, supply, and you use the methodology to manage those suppliers. Now, what you typically do is start the implementation internally in your organization. So you wouldn't necessarily involve um, suppliers right at the beginning of the implementation. However, they will start to feel the difference in the way the business orders with them and, and manages open orders um, with those suppliers. And what happens with Palm is the implementation and the model starts opening up to those key suppliers to the point where um, we have clients where um, the business that's implemented the DDMRP methodology doesn't um, manage the supplier based on adherence to due dates of orders anymore. They provide them with visibility of their buffer status of the raw materials that they supply, and they simply say to the supplier, you make sure that my buffers are always in the zone where they need to be. So that's how they typically work um, with their suppliers. When it comes to working with key customers, I think the thing to remember with DDMRP is it is not a customer-specific planning methodology. We're planning a item at a location. So it's less concerned about who the customers are that are um, ordering or buying that product from you. If you say you want that product to be available, the methodology is always going to try and drive you to 100% service level, regardless of who the, the individual customer is that's buying that product or the group of customers that's, that's buying that product. And again, you typically implement internally in the business and hopefully with time as availability improves, which we find it does, the customers just start realizing the benefits of the, the methodology being implemented and, and running well in the organization. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, great, great answer, Alan. I think uh, the, uh, to summarize, it really depends on what level of maturity you are in your uh, demand-driven journey. Uh, ideally, the success uh, today, uh, industries, no industry can claim its success is uh, decoupled from its suppliers. The you know more more and more industries are getting so deeply entrenched with their supply chain that their success depends more on their suppliers than their own performance. Uh, yesterday, I was having this interesting conversation with one of my neighbors, and we were catching up for tea. And uh, he was telling about how the, the glass industry supply chain has played a more important role in the vaccine availability uh, than actually the pharmaceutical industry's ability to mobilize resources uh, because all of these vaccines are dosed in vials and therefore you need to have a specific size of glass and you know cleanliness, purity and so on and so forth. And because the glass industry uh, could not ramp up its capacity and in some instances, the ones who could ramp up their capacity made a positive difference on the industry. So. Uh, indeed, you need to work collaboratively. So goes without saying uh, to to involve them more and more. Great. I think that's about time we have. <laughs> there are some more questions. I'm happy to see many of our old friends join in with us uh, this morning. It's a wonderful feeling. Um, okay, Ashish. Uh, okay, we'll take a stab at your question perhaps predicting the demand probability distribution is a vital element of any inventory optimization how does ddmrp handle it uh, so ddmrp is again uh, ashish uh, the, you know there is a beautiful uh, 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 you know a module that the demand driven institute has put together uh, which i highly recommend to you and all of our uh, friends and professional colleagues uh, that you must uh, at some point go through it uh, it's called as a demand-driven planner professional. Uh, it, you can either take it as a course or you can also pursue the certification, uh, which me and Ganesh did it uh, over the uh, lockdown period uh, last year and we got certified and few of our other colleagues at SSA got it. Uh, and it's uh, something to really uh, uh, you know, pursue. It will answer many of your questions on that front. Uh, so it, it has elements of predictability. It has elements of you know, ramp up, ramp down based on demand and so on. It's, uh, it's quite a fascinating science. Uh, on the same and our friends from sfo have a question how the single piece flow will help us in the inventory so 
again the 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 point uh, is that uh, ddmrp aims towards a true north of single piece flow where you sell one buy one and make one and so on uh, but of course you need to balance the need for uh, you know you cannot buy in one unit if you're if you're a trading environment you'll have to fill a container and you have to do various other considerations this is where ddmrp helps you to balance the need for uh, for not exceeding but at the same time maintaining the minimal or optimal inventory cover uh, without losing your service levels and i know we had this conversation yesterday uh, mr balaji and team and we will catch up i'll share with you some more interesting stories when we meet uh, soon next week and uh, probably have a one on one with you in this regard uh, great uh, so wonderful thanks for those who have patiently stayed with us uh, uh, this morning uh, yeah, or afternoon for those from india uh, yeah it was it was quite uh, exciting to discuss with you i know we overshot we usually wrap these up in about an hour but uh, i think the questions were very interesting and engaging so thank you everyone and uh, stay safe and stay blessed uh, i know that it's it's a crazy time out there especially in india uh, you know stay safe and our best wishes to you and your loved ones and uh, you know if any questions queries hit me up ganesh we can connect on linkedin or or write to us and anytime we can uh, we can talk uh, and you know that's all from us and and bye now thank you Thank <laughs> you.